wife and I travel out of here on the 4th of October. And the day before we were to fly out, I came down with a diary. So it was so persistent as she telling me, boy, go and see the doctor. So I went, and the doctor advised me that there is a gastrointestinal virus going around. He says, only last in two days, three for the most. And it's very common now, because he's seen a lot of patients with the same complaint. So I told myself, doctor, I fly now tomorrow. He said, well, if you had a flyer tomorrow, the most I could do for you is tell you, between now and tomorrow, don't eat any grease. Just eat dry biscuits, eggs, and stuff like that, you know, that is non-greasy, non yeah. Boil egg and so on. I say, well, I can do that, but there's a chance I'm taking because it's today for tomorrow. He said, what you have to do is, we are a pamper. I say, what? I ain't doing that. So I went home, and I told, the doctor, I told my wife what the doctor had said. She said, well, why not go back to him? Since you don't want to wear a pamper, go back to him and ask him for a letter so we could postpone the flight because the airline will take a, a medical um, indicator that you're not well and postpone the flight. So I went back to him and he gave me a letter. But you know, I'm telling myself in the meantime, I can't be standing up in front of congregations like this in, in Longanville there and talk to people about faith. Amen. And when my time comes, to put my faith in God, I postponed the flight. So when I got home, I told my wife, I ain't wearing no pamper. Look at right there. I said, I'll be flying tomorrow. No, the flight to London is eight and a half hours. And I'm telling myself, I can entrust myself in God's hands for eight and a half hours. Look at my wife there. I went on that flight for eight and a half hours, and not once did I have to go to that bathroom. Yeah. We can trust God. Yeah. All right? We can trust yeah. God. Yeah. And, you know, when we in the pulpit here, when is our turn to put our confidence in God? Yeah. We have to stand up. Yeah. We have to stand up. Yeah. So thank God we had a good flight. I didn't have to embarrass myself because I tell myself if I, take, if I put on a pamper, it goes to smell. <laughs> so I said, hon, I ain't putting on no pamper. I said, I'll be flying tomorrow. And we did, and God came through for me. All glory be to God, of course. All glory and praise be to God. You know, I tell myself, you dare to wear a pamper? I say, Lord, take me home, please. <laughs> the pride, pride. I don't mind, but I am wearing no pamper in life. So, let's get in this morning to the word of God. Because this morning I want to share with you seven ways in which we are sure about what happens to us between death and the resurrection. For those saints who have died now and in time gone by, the question always arises, where are they? Where are they? And does the scripture tell us where they are and in what state are they? And we want to explore that from the word of God because it is true that the Bible doesn't give us a whole lot of details about what happens after death. But God has given us enough. And we want to explore what the word of God has said because we, when we search the scriptures, we see the indicators very clearly. So, 
my topic this morning is when Christian believers die. Now, all of us have a shelf life. Once we are born, something will take us out of this world. And when our expiry date comes, there is nothing we can do about it. Nothing. Nothing. The time has come. You know, there was this story of this guy who was cooking a real big splurge at home in his kitchen and he heard a knock on his door. So when he went to the door and he opened the door, he saw death. And death said, I'll come for you. He saw, oh God, oh God, oh God, I ain't ready yet, death. I ain't ready to go yet. You come and you're surprising me. I can't, I can't go. That's the only name at the top of the list here. He tells them, come inside. And he put out a nice splurge, a banquet for death. And death fully belly. And when death fully belly, he went and he lay down on a couch and he sleep. And while he's sleeping, the fellow take the pad with all the list of names on it, and he scratch off his name from the top, <laughs> and he put it on the last page at the bottom. So when Dad get up, Dad say, "Boy, you treat me so good, and your taste, your your food tastes so good. Here what I go do for you." I go start from the bottom of the last page. <laughs> you can't cheat that. When your time comes, your time comes. You can't bribe that. Yeah. All right? So all of us have an expiry date. Yeah. Another fellow made a deal with debt. These are important what I'm telling you because it's going to fit in here. He made a deal with debt. He said, Dad, don't take me unless they give me a sign that you're coming. And Dad agreed. Then he became an old man who was sitting in a rocking chair in his porch. And while he was sitting there, Dad showed up. So he told Dad, but we had an agreement. He was, give me a sign before you come. Dad said, come. And he came in front of a mirror he had in his house. He said, look at your hair. You're not bald. Your hair is gray. He said, to hear me, notice, you have to tilt your ears to hear me properly. Dad said, look how long it takes you to get up from that rocking chair and come here. Dad said, I gave you several signs. I gave you several signs. And now... It's time to go. But we need not be afraid of death. Not the believing Christian. And here is why. My text this morning, Revelation chapter 6. Yeah, he got several signs. He was aging. Revelation chapter 6. And we're going to take it from verse 9. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God. A quick background to the scripture. He's talking here about people who didn't make it in the rapture and had to go through and will have to go through the great tribulation. And many of them who heard the gospel disregarded it. Jesus came, took the church, took all of us away. Those who are left behind, many of them will turn to Christ during those horrible seven years of the great tribulation. And the Antichrist will kill many of them. 
for the, the word of God. You see, it says there, I saw the souls under the altar, the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God. They refused to take the mark of the beast, and so they were killed. So that's the background. Who were slain for the word of God, the testimony which they held, verse 10, and they cried out with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth, those who had killed them. Then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren, who would be killed as they were, was completed. Father, we thank you this morning for your precious word. We are about to look into the treasures that you have given us. And we pray, O oh God, as we plow those treasures, you would give us understanding, you would gladden our hearts, and you would encourage us, O oh God, and strengthen our faith. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Now, there are several things here in that short bit of scripture that we see. One, these people were dead. They had been slain for their testimony and the word of God. They stood up against the Antichrist system. And for their faith, they were killed. And they've gone to a place to rest. Notice, these people are dead. They are in heaven. Because John says when he opened the fifth seal, I'm not going to go through the seals, but he reached the fifth seal. He saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God. But I want you to notice that these people could pray. These people could speak. They had emotions because they wanted revenge that their blood was shed by those on the earth, the forces of the Antichrist. So they had emotions. They could converse. They could hear. Because they said, they cried out with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those that dwell on the earth. So they are dead, but they can still speak, hear. They had emotions, and they had awareness of what was going on on the earth. That didn't pass away from them. But notice also, as we look deeper into the word, then a white robe was given to each of them. A white robe. Which means in some way, the Bible doesn't give us too much details, but these people have some kind of body that allows them to be in God's presence in heaven. A white robe was given to each of them. These little indicators give us an insight as to what happens when we die. And I want us to understand that there are some, many people who believe that when you die, you go out of existence. You become nothing. You are, some people say, in unconscious resting. You don't know what's happening. That is not so. They know very well what's happening on the earth. They're calling for God to avenge them. So they're not on, they are not in unconscious resting. And people say that 
when you die, I'm not going to call the particular denomination, you cease to exist. Your soul just goes out of existence. You don't exist anymore. You're not there. And this is against that background I'm bringing this message. So I want us to look secondly now at the book of Luke, chapter 16. Luke chapter 16. This is a common one, you all know it. It's the story of the rich man and Lazarus. Now, Bible said this was a parable. This is not a parable. Because if you notice, Jesus told many parables, but he never gave a name to anybody in his parables. This is the only time, and this is why this is not a parable, this was a definite, two definite human beings, either that he knew from eternity past before he came into this world, Jesus knew the story of these two men, or during his lifetime on earth, he knew of these two men, but we don't know. But there was a certain rich man, verse 1, verse 19, sorry. That word certain means there was a definite man. This is no parable. There was a certain, a real rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and feared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus. See, he names the person. Full of sores who was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. He was living in abject poverty. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. Now, that's an important detail I want you to pay attention to. When the believer dies, angels come and take you immediately into God's presence. You don't go into nothingness. You don't cease to exist as some people believe. Angels came. He was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in torments, in Hades, Hades is hell. Greek word means hell. He lifted up his eyes. Ah, you see? He could see. Dead, but he could see. And saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Before Calvary, Hades had all Ju Judaic scholars the early church believers, fathers, and doctors today believe that at one time Hades, hell, had two compartments and a big gulf between them. Hades is hell. Where the righteous, when they died, went to one side and the unrighteous to the other side. But he could see Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. He has seen the imagery that Jesus gives here is one of Lazarus sitting in a place of high honor. Reclining in a place of comfort. Abraham's bosom. Now, 24 says, then he cried and said, man could talk to, not only see, because you see, this is the only time in the Bible that Jesus takes the curtain separating time and eternity. And he draws the curtain back. And he gives us a glimpse into what happens in eternity. This is the only time. And he saw Lazarus and he said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. So in hell, you could also taste. 
For I am tormented. He's living in torments. In this flame, he could feel as well. His senses haven't gone. This man is not non-existent. He has not become nothing when he died. For I am tormented in this place. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and you are tormented. The word he is comforted tells us where and what state the believer is in when he dies. He is in a place of comfort. He's in a place of comfort. So he's alive. He has some kind of body. We don't know what kind of body it is. But we know that he could wear a robe. And he is in a place where he is sitting in paradise. And if you read Lord Long, you'll see where the rich man begs Abraham, send somebody to talk to my brothers. Because I have five brothers. So in hell, he also had memory. People, when they die, have memory. Both in hell, and as we saw just now, in heaven. Because we saw in Revelation where they remembered how they got to heaven, how they were killed. So they have memory. So that is my background this morning. I will come back to the angels came and carried Abraham in his bosom to prove to you from the word of God, not from my head, to prove to you that when we die, we go immediately into heaven. Everybody say immediately for me. Immediately. So the angels came and took him to heaven. Now heaven, where is heaven? We want to make sure that we know that there's a place called heaven. And that we go there, our souls go there. Heaven is the place where we live with an atmosphere above us. And in the atmosphere, that's where the birds live. That's where there are clouds and so on. That's the atmosphere. Above the atmosphere, there's a second heaven. And this is where all the interstellar beings live, beings in great commas, the stars, the moon, the sun, okay? Asteroids, comets. That's the second heaven. And then the third heaven is where the throne of God is. Remember Paul said that he was taken to the third heaven and he saw things and he heard things that it was not allowed for him to reveal. The third heaven. That's where the throne of God is. It's above the universe that we know. It's the place where God rules. Psalm 103 and 19 tells us. Psalms 103 and 19 tells us. The Lord has established his throne in heaven. And his kingdom rules over all. Psalm 103 and 19. So there's a place called heaven. And that's where God rules from. It's also the place where he hears our prayers. Second Chronicles tell us. And you all know that scripture verse by heart. If my people, go ahead, if my people who are called by my name, Second Chronicles 7, 7. Second Chronicles, it is 7 and 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven 
and will forgive their sin and heal their land. I will hear from heaven. That's where God rules and where he hears our prayers. It is also that same heaven, our final destination when we depart this earth. When our expiry date comes, our respective expiry date comes. That is our final destination. Jesus said, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place, a place, a definite place for you that where I am, there you will be also. So that's our final destiny. So there's a heaven and that's where our souls go when we die. So let's talk about our souls this morning now. Let us talk about our souls. Between death and the resurrection to come at the rapture, the soul, it is a lie, it is untrue. It is a false teaching that the soul ceases to exist. That the soul becomes non-existent. Or is it some kind of unconscious resting? It doesn't know what's going on. The Bible teaches us that there is no interruption of life at the end of this life. There is no interruption of life. That's why we shouldn't fear death. Luke 23 and 43. Turn with me to Luke 23 and 43. Twenty and forty she says. Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, blasphemed Jesus, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. Is one of the two thieves on the cross. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing that you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, for certain, definitely, without a doubt, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Now, the thief thought that he would see Jesus in some future kingdom. He said, when you come into your kingdom, remember me. So he thought that sometime way into the future, the kingdom of God would happen. But Jesus said to him, no, no, no. Today, today you will be with me in paradise. Meaning, there is no interruption in the life of the thief who died and who repented. No interruption in his life. This very day, as you die, you are going to be with me in paradise. There's no interruption. No interruption whatsoever. This very day. Let's look at another example. Jesus spoke these two examples that the believer immediately upon death goes into the presence of God. John chapter 11. John chapter 11. 
And I want us to read these scriptures carefully. If you have John chapter 11, I'm looking at verses 25 to 26. So Lazarus has died, and Martha, his sister, went out to the village where Jesus was to give Jesus the news that his dear friend had passed. And Jesus said to her in verse 25, Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. At the last day, long in the future. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, there are two categories. One, though he may die, he shall live. That's the first category. And the second category, and whoever lives right now like us and believes in me shall never die. Shall never die. If believers are non-existent when they die, between the death and the resurrection to come, then Jesus' statement is not true. That they shall never die. Because if you go into non-existence, then there's a break. There's a break. If he has to come back and bring you into being, then it can't happen. You can't, you, it cannot happen. If you are non-existent, You've interrupted your existence. But Jesus said, never die. You shall never die. And therefore, we know that he who is the resurrection and the life and who, who knows all these things, he cannot lie. So, whether you are in category A, Though he may die, he shall live. That covers those who have gone on before us. Or if you are alive, whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. The second time that Jesus establishes that we do not die, as some people teach, is in the book of Mark chapter 12. Verses 26 to 27. Put a mark with me. Mark. Chapter 12. Here the Sadducees who did not believe in immortality or the resurrection didn't believe in those things are trying to trap Jesus and they tell him if a man had seven wives while he was alive and seven brothers had that wife sorry if a man, had, if a man and his brothers had one wife when they go to heaven whose wife whose wife and Jesus said to them because they didn't believe in the in the resurrection. He says in Matthew 12, Mark 12, 26. But concerning the dead, that they, ri that they rise, but concerning the dead, that they rise, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the burning bush passage, how God spoke to him saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob? You all recall that when Moses was in the desert, he saw this burning bush. And the bush wasn't burning, but a fire was engulfing the bush. And when he went over, God identified himself out of the fire and said, I am the God of 
of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So Jesus takes them back to that book of Moses, book of Exodus. He is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. You are therefore greatly mistaken. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had died thousands of years ago. And here Jesus is saying, God is the God of the living, not of the dead. In other words, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, though they were dead thousands of years ago, they are still alive. Because God is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. Let's look at, we're still looking at the soul. What is written by the great apostle Paul? Before I go into the scripture, let me just take you back through some English grammar. We know from going to school and learning English that there are tenses, verb tenses. There's the present tense, where you are speaking of something that will happen, is happening right now. There's the future tense, something that will, will happen in the future. There's the past tense, something that happened already, completed in the past. There's the perfect tense and the blue perfect tense and all that dealing with the past, right? Now the Greek language from which this Bible was translated is a more specific, very specific language. You know, like we say, we use the word love, and we, love could mean anything. It could mean romantic love, one word we use, love. It could mean sexual love. It could mean agape love. The love of sacrifice. Right, and so on. Phileo love. The love you have for your children, your friends, your family, and so on. Phileo. There are five Greek words. And the Greek language is so specific that it uses each word for the specific meaning. So if you're talking about a wife who will give up all her money to spend for her sick husband, that is agape love, that's a sacrificial love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that's agape. You wouldn't use eros, which is Romantic love, the love of poems and the sunrise and the birds. That's another word. The Greeks were very specific. Very specific language. Similarly, the Greek had a verb tense called the aorist tense. So just now I told you, past tense, present tense. The, verb, the Greek had a very specific tense called the aorist tense. And it was used to indicate instant action. Instant action. Something happening right away. Now with that background, let's look at the book of Philippians. Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1 verse 21 Philippians 1 verse 21 I will read from the New International Version. It says, For me, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, 
this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? He asks. I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Now let me unpack that because that is loaded with important meaning for us. If you were to see the original Greek manuscripts from which this English Bible was translated, you will see that Paul used the aorist tense of the verb to indicate instant action. So, the words in that scripture, to depart and to be, you see it in front of you there? He is, I am torn between the two. Whether I should stay here on earth and continue to work and save men and women or whether I should go home with Jesus. And he says, I am torn between the two. I desire to depart, that is in the aorist tense, and to be also in the aorist tense with Christ. Which means, what Paul is saying is that as soon as I die, I am going to be with Christ. As soon as I depart, He doesn't use the future tense or anything like that. He uses the aorist tense, which indicates instant action. The moment I die, Sister Yaz, the moment I depart this life, I will be with Christ. There's no time lapse between. It's instant action. Notice also, for Paul, to die is gain. This life that we like to cling to, this life that we like to cling to, we feel we can't leave it. As far as Paul is concerned, that's a loss. This life is a loss. To depart and be with Christ is a gain. And I want you to underline. He said, I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ right away, which is better by far. Underline that to me. Better by far. Death is a gain. And it is superior and better than this life. That's why Paul said, talking about those who have lost loved ones. He said, we don't have to sorrow as those who have no hope. We have a real hope Amen. that the person who has died is already in God's presence. Amen. So we have no right to sorrow like those who have no hope. So let's go back now to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 6. Chapter 5 and verse 6. Jade? Jade, want to get ready with the first song. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Verse 6. So, we are always confident Knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident. Believers, notice he uses the word twice. We are confident. Knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. Then he goes on, verse 8. We are confident, yes. Well pleased, rather, to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. And again, he uses the aorist verb tense. Again, he uses the aorist verb tense. Brethren, when we die, we don't have to fear death. It's instant action. As we die, 
Jade, as we die, you know, one songwriter tried to capture what going to heaven upon death would be like. All right? And that songwriter wrote this song called I Shall Know Him. That's Fanny Crosby. Perhaps the greatest and most prolific by far hymn writer. Let's listen to how she tries to capture her entry into glory. I put up the lyrics for the song for you. And redeemed by his side I shall stand I shall know him I shall know him By the print of the nails in his hand And the luster of his kindly beaming eye Oh, my full heart will praise him for the mercy, love, and grace that prepared for me a mansion in the sky. I shall know, I shall know him, and redeemed by his side I shall stand. I shall know him. I shall know him. By the prince of the nails. I shall know him and redeem my side. I shall stand. I shall know him. I shall know him by the prince of the nails in his hand. In a robe of spotless white. He will lead me where no tears will ever fall. In the glad song of ages, I shall mingle with delight, but I long to see. That is certainly comforting that the loved ones who have gone on before the Bible doesn't tell us this but I assume that if my both parents are dead, they died in Christ I have brothers um, I have nephews who have died, sisters and I'm sure when I get there this is not in the Bible but Jesus will want them to know that I have come home and I suspect that he has a welcoming committee to let them know one more has come home. I believe that with all my heart that they will have even further comfort in heaven to know that another one has made it. So that's the soul. We've established the soul. We saw that when Lazarus died, Angels came and immediately took him 
Jesus said into Abraham's bosom immediately. What about the body? What about the body? That's the soul. What about the body between death and resurrection? The Bible tells us that the body sleeps. 1 Thessalonians 4.15 I'll read it for you. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, God will bring him with him those who sleep in Jesus. He's not talking about the soul sleeping there. That's the body he's talking about. Even so, God will bring with him with Jesus, those who sleep in him. For this we say to you, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. Now, the body is at rest while awaiting it's transformation. Now let's go back to Lazarus. When Lazarus died, if you read on in verse 39, you will see where Martha says, how could you bring him back? It's four days now he's dead. And say so he is stinking because he's decomposing. That body is decomposing. Martha says it's four, years, four days now and he's stinking. And when Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. That body, that decomposing body, came right back to life. That decomposing body came right back to life. And that's what will happen at the rapture. The righteous of all ages. The church first. The church those of us who live from Pentecost to now, we are the first, if we die in Christ, to receive our, our body, our resurrected body. The Old Testament saints will come at the end of the tribulation and the saints who died during the tribulation they will be resurrected at the end of the tribulation, but the church will be raptured up approximately seven years before. Now, millions of us, millions who died in the grave, who drowned at sea and they never found their bodies, shark eat them, whatever happened, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. God is going to reunite the spirits in heaven, the souls in heaven, with the bodies that have died and have fallen asleep. That is the word of God. You'll remember that at the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus took Peter, James, and John up to the mount with him. And while he was there, the Bible says he was transfigured. He became glistening white and a bright light shone over, shone over him. And then appeared Elijah and Moses talking to Jesus. Now Elijah and Moses died thousands of years ago. And yet, the book of Luke tells us what they were discussing. They were having a conversation. They came right back to life in person. And they were discussing Jesus' soon to come death. Luke revealed that was the conversation. But these men died thousands of years ago. And yet, they came back in person. So it will be. So it will be. With the souls that are in heaven right now in God's presence. 
They are in a state of joy. They are praising the Lord. We don't know what else they are doing. But what God has revealed to us is sufficient to, for us to be comforted. Because you see, when the soul comes to re, to re to inhabit the resurrected body, it will not only be a body that went down in the earth and was decomposed. Perhaps there is nothing left. But we will also not only renew the body, he is going to glorify the body and give us a new body, an immortal body. An immortal body where you will never die again. Never die again. That's another topic for discussion. But that is the, the great hope that we have our souls and our body. So let me just sum up for you as I bring this to a conclusion. These are your takeaways. For the believing Christian who dies, there are seven things that will comfort us and give us every assurance that we are not a people without hope. One, we are going to be in a place of comfort. Not in a place of torment as a rich man. We are going to be like Lazarus in a place of comfort. Luke chapter 16. We are going to be with Christ. Because in John 17 and 24, when Jesus was making his high priestly prayer to his father, he asked God that we will be with him. With him. Not dead. With him. We'll be with Christ. That's the second takeaway. The third is death represents a gain for us. It is also far better than this life. That's the fourth. The fifth is we are immediately in God's presence as we pass out of this life. Immediately in God's presence. Seven. We have unbroken continuity of life. We don't cease to exist. And seven. We still have some kind of body. Then we get to the other side. As we saw in the book of Revelation, a white robe was given to all of the tribulation saints who died. A white robe. If you are given a robe, it means you have some kind of body. And those are the comforting words. As believers, we have no reason to be afraid. Where we are going is far better and is again. And these are the wonderful words of life. See it? These are the wonderful words of life. You all know that song? Sing them over again to me. Wonderful words of life. Let me more of their beauty see. Wonderful words of life. Words of life and beauty. Teach me faith and duty. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Let's go again. Christ, the blessed one, gives to all. Wonderful words of life, sinless to the love and call. Wonderful words of life, all so freely given. Wooing us to heaven, beautiful words, wonderful. 
wonderful world, wonderful world of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Father, we give thanks. For your word this morning, we pray, O oh God, that your people are given every assurance that the spirits, O oh God, are confident, confident that they shall never die. But there is something better, far better, not just better, but the word of God says, far better to be in your presence, to be with you. So we give thanks this morning for ministering your word to us. May you be glorified, O oh God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Is there anyone here this morning who doesn't know Christ as Savior? And who will end up like the rich man? Is there anyone who would like to give their lives to Christ this morning? Anybody who isn't saved, doesn't know Jesus in a personal way, have fellowship with him? Is there anyone? Anyone sing them over again to me? Wonderful words of life.